everybody. Welcome to Bone to Pick. I am Michael Davis, and we are coming to you today from the esteemed Juilliard School here in New York City. And uh, we are extremely fortunate to be able to sit down today with uh, one of the great bass trombone players of all time, uh, the bass trombonist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Mr. Blair Bollinger. Um, Blair uh, was born outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and grew up in the great state of Georgia. Uh, he has a degree from the Curtis Institute of Music. Um, his teachers included the great Charles Vernon and Glenn Dotson. Uh, right out of school, he won the position of bass trombonist in the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, appointed there by the maestro Ricardo Muti. Uh, he has been the bass trombone player in the orchestra for the past 32 years. Uh, he is a founding member of the trombone supergroup Four of a Kind. Uh, he's active worldwide as a solo artist and clinician and chamber musician. Uh, he is currently on the faculty here at Juilliard School in New York, as well as Curtis Institute in Philadelphia and Temple University, also in Philadelphia. Um, he helped create the Blair Bollinger bass trombone model made by the great S.E. Shires Company. And uh, Blair and I share a common bond in that regard, that we both have uh, signature trombones with that incredible company. We will talk at great length about that. And uh, on a personal level, um, I've been a fan of Blair's for the first since the first time I heard him play, and I was fortunate to get him to come up and uh, play on a CD I was doing many years ago yeah, now called cool. New Brass, uh, and we Nitz on and uh, Koichiro and Joe Alessi, and it was uh, Bill Reichenbach and I had done the CD right, together. Right, right. So. I appreciated that, and I appreciate this even more. I know you're getting ready to go back to Philadelphia tonight See. and had a long day teaching, so we, uh, we really appreciate your time and looking forward to talking about your extraordinary career. You're very kind. Thank you for the kind words, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah, well, great. Let's jump right in and uh, let's talk about your, uh, your, you know, your early years in Georgia and maybe what, uh, what made you gravitate or inspire you to play the trombone and ultimately the, the bass trombone. Sure. Um, my first instrument was piano and then violin for a while. And then uh, in fifth grade, they gave the whole school a music test, and I scored well on the music test because I've been doing the lessons already. And then they said, you want to be in the band? I said, sure. What do you want to play? I said, well, my friend Paul plays the trombone. I think I'll play the trombone. And that's <laughs> seriously how I got started okay. on the trombone. <laughs> Fantastic. So you must have had a lot of success in, in the high school years and stuff like that to be able to uh, yeah, get to the point well, of getting going to Well, I had a good teacher uh, from the Atlanta area, a freelancer named Richard Brady, did uh, a lot for me in high school years and played in the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra then mm. there and had coachings with the Atlanta Symphony players at the time. So, uh, and did, uh, did summer music festivals. That's where I first met uh, my main teacher at Curtis, Charlie Vernon, was at the Brevard Music Center down in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I had worked with him in the summers. Wow, that's awesome. Let's talk about, uh, I've always had this fascination with Curtis because it's such a, and it's one of the great conservatories any, anywhere in the world and, and it's basically the greatest uh, orchestral training ground, I guess you Thanks. could yeah. you say that. Uh, and so many great musicians yourself, Joe Alessi, uh, you know, incredible amount of players that went there. Um, maybe talk a little bit about your experience at, at, at Curtis mm -hmm. and we were touching on it before the interview. I was so impressed uh, when I got to hear a master class that uh, Glenn Dotson uh, gave, and I know he was one of your principal teachers, sure. so maybe talk yeah. about your experience with Glenn. Sure. Uh, Curtis was great for me. I was there five years. Um, a, a student's time at Curtis is decided by the, well, the student has input, but his major teacher and then the president of the school, and it varies. You know, there's, uh, generally, it's four years for a college degree, but some students, I think the youngest Curtis student was eight or nine to start there. Wow. And then the singers are maybe even 30 or something. So there's quite an age range. So the, the it's, there's some, it's the school is small enough that everything's decided individually that way. Wow. So at any rate, so I was there for five years and uh, had lessons with both uh, Charlie Vernon and Glenn Dodson. And um, it was great because the, they're two fantastic players and played beautifully together in the orchestra, but in many ways have very different approaches to the instrument. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I learned that there's more than one way to play the trombone and make great music, you know, mm -hmm. or any instrument. You know, mm -hmm. This is one of my students will tell you one of my favorite lines is what we do is art and not science. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's more than one right answer. There's different ways to, to do this and make great music. So yeah, had five years. Um, at Curtis and the uh, guest conductors from the Philadelphia Orchestra would come over on Saturday mornings and rehearse, you know, whatever they were doing with the orchestra that week. They'd come over and rehearse the Curtis students. So we did one. I played with Eugene Ormandy one time. I was oh, 18. Wow. He was 80. <laughs> 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 we did one. We did a, a public TV Bartok Concerto Orchestra project. Oh, wow. Um, that must have been incredible. Yeah, so that was, I was a, a scared, stiff 18-year-old at the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so the Curtis years were great for me. That's awesome. And they only, if, if I'm... If I'm correct in assuming they only have enough people to field the orchestra. Like there would Plus be some singers trombones. and pianos and uh, mm -hmm. organ conducting, yeah, a few extra things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, yeah, four trombones. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So the curriculum would also include chamber music as well? Yep. or is it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so like now there's uh, two, yeah, two brass quintets in the school. There's enough personnel in the school to have two standing brass quintets, and the faculty rotate through coaching that. And then we have a brass choir, which I conduct. We do brass and percussion. We do uh, just like one concert a year with that. And then uh, there is individual horn studio class and trumpet and trombone low brass classes. So we'll do some uh, quartets out of that as well. Yeah, cool. Well, one thing that in doing uh, the research for this interview is so fascinating that you went basically right from Curtis and won the position at the Philadelphia Orchestra. Not an easy thing to do for uh, on any level, but to do Thanks. it at that at yeah. that level. And uh, I, I guess I guess that concert with Ormandy probably helped you. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Face, well, uh, Ricardo I subbed a good bit. bit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So um, when Ed Kleinhammer retired in Chicago, then uh, they were courting Charlie Vernon or trying him, and he was he was of course uh, well, he wanted the job. So he would go out there and sub a fair amount. Okay. And so then the Philadelphia Orchestra would ask me to sub for my teacher. So there were. I don't know, multiple weeks in the past couple, his past couple years, past couple seasons in the orchestra that uh, I would play for him. So a lot of the players knew me already, and uh, Muti had heard me several times. And so after the, that audition, um, well, I should start the, in that, that was uh, April, I had a good month. Uh, there was, there was a student <laughs> solo competition, so I won that for the Philly Orchestra. So wow. I got to play a concerto with the orchestra the next season. And then two weeks after that was the job audition. And after that one, uh, I was the last man standing, but Muti was concerned about a kid still in school. So I was given a one-year contract with the understanding that there would be a, a full audition the next season. So then I started the, the next fall playing and then played the, a concerto with, as the, they changed the rules, you can't do that anymore. You can't be the student soloist winner and still be playing in the orchestra. <laughs> so the, things got a little bit messy there. Um, but then in following January was another full national audition and I came out on top after that one. Muti said, Bob Benny, so you can give the kid the job. That so, is awesome. Um, that, that's why I say then, 32 years later, I haven't, haven't got far, just a few blocks down the street. <laughs> <laughs> well, no need to go far when you're uh, going yeah, from Curtis yeah. to the Philadelphia yeah. Orchestra. That's, that's a great job. They, you know, they take us all over the world and get to play great music with great colleagues. And yeah, so I'm thrilled to have it. Awesome. I mean, I, I'm sure there are many highlights in those 32 years, but what are some of your... Uh, some of your favorite memories, if you have some that jump out. Sure, again. like you know the the the, the early ones, the, the first big things, or you know what stick with you. Uh, like uh, the first big tour we did was European festivals tour. So we're playing, you know, playing in Salzburg with Muti and Pines and Rome and stuff like that. Mm. And then um, uh, geez, we did. You know, it was a William Tell in Buenos Aires that was crazy fast. <laughs> Thank you, Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> so little things like that stick in your mind. Yeah. What was the what was the, what was in the section when you won the job in 1986? So it's um, it was Glenn then and uh, Tyrone Bruniger was associate principal and Eric Carlson our second trombone uh, was also new. So he started in the orchestra four weeks before I did. A fact oh, which wow. he never lets me forget. You see, <laughs> I've seniority on you <laughs> by four weeks. Thank you, Eric. I'm teasing him. We're, we're good friends. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. Friends and good colleagues. So yeah. So. Uh, so we had basically had 10 years more or less with uh, uh, Tyrone and uh, Glenn and Eric and I. And then Tyrone and Glenn both retired real close to each other and we hired Nitsan and Matt. So we've been basically 20 years together then with uh, the four of us. Nitsan wow. went to the West Coast for two years, but we got him back. So right. he did yeah. two years yeah, with yeah. the LA Philharmonic and that didn't work out for a lot, of, a lot of reasons, but so we're glad to have him back in Philly. Yeah, of course. I remember we did that. Uh Many years ago now, I did that Super Bone Sunday at Rowan University. And oh, the, right. And the, uh, okay. This, okay. Uh, Bill Reichenbach and I came out, and then you guys were kind enough to bring the section yeah. over, and so to get to yeah. hear you guys all together I'm playing uh, acoustically was a, uh, really amazing. I've always been a big Nissan fan. He's such a beautiful, beautiful player. Beautiful player. Beautiful. That's awesome. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you can, and I, I don't mean to be too general or too vague about it, but um, from your position as the bass trombone player, what are some qualities you look for uh, that you like to hear in a principal trombone player, and you can you can use Nitsan as an example, or Glenn, sure. or what, uh, things that just qualities that you look for. And I'm I'm asking that a lot for for we have a lot of younger folks that uh, tune into our series, and and it's always helpful to get you know mm -hmm. advice from a player of your stature. 
Well, uh, to get an orchestra job, you have to convince a committee that you're the right player for the job. Uh, so it's you know I have my own preferences, and but there's that's why we have a committee because you know I have ten other colleagues with different preferences. But certainly, uh, we hire Nissan twice, <laughs> <laughs> so we like he's playing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he had it was a, a full open audition when he came back the second time. Um, so uh, oh know, wow, so he didn't have any. Uh, there was no no, no well track. No, he. He was auto advanced to the finals, but uh, that's sort of standard thing. If a, a member or former member of the orchestra auditions, then they go automatically to finals. Oh, okay. Do that. But okay. He, had, he had to play behind the screen. Okay. Every everyone plays one round behind the screen. Anyway, so uh, uh, you know what we're looking for is obviously you know technically excellent, and uh, it's a, a lyricism to his playing that I love, and um, and just the way that he and Eric and I I think really blend really well together. Um, it's, it's part of his uh, audition. Well, both times we did section playing as we normally do. So there's, there's, um, you know, you play behind a screen for several rounds, and then uh, Philadelphia Orchestra current policy is, is there, you know, prelims, semis, and finals. And then after finals, the screen comes down, and we have what we call super finals. And so for the super finals, then we pick like the last one or two, maybe three players, and then they play by themselves where we can see them. And also with trombones, absolutely we do section playing. Okay. Um, and so then, <laughs> after working with Nitsan for 18 years, then he came back and we did an audition <laughs> for section playing, you know. And uh, one of the other co committee members said, well, when Nitsan played, it sounded like the Philadelphia Orchestra trombones. <laughs> and one of the other auditioners said, yeah, no kidding, it sounded like the Philadelphia Orchestra trombones. So that was a very unique situation when you have a, a former beloved member who, who left and, and then came back. But, um, yeah, so, I can imagine that's pretty unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, he's a great guy and great player, so that, that worked out really well. And Matt Vaughn was the runner-up, is, is our co-principal now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when he served, you know, played two years as principal and sounded great, and so they uh, promoted him to co-principal from he had been associate. And so we're, so we're lucky in the Philadelphia Orchestra we have two great first trombones. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about... Uh, in, in, in the orchestra, the relationship between the bass trombone and the tuba, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, obviously really important, and it's kind of like you're, you're, you're the bridge between, yeah. between the, the, the trombones and the, and the uh, obviously you have your own voice as the bass trombone, but, but, you know, I guess it's a similar answer to what you described in the principal trombone, but maybe just talk about, uh, about, yeah. the, about, about the tuba in general a little sure. bit. Sure, uh, Finding Carol was, is a great story, I, I love that one. Um, so, um, uh, Paul Kerswicki, our longtime uh, wonderful tuba player, had retired, uh, or announced his retirement. And um, let's see, we had like one round of auditions and came up empty, we didn't uh, find the right person. And then we were having another round coming up, and I was reviewing uh, tapes for a summer camp we had up in Bar Harbor, Maine. We had a Bar Harbor Brass Week. We had a wonderful camp there for 15 years. Uh, we've since closed it down. It, it ran its course, but it was mm -hmm. a wonderful thing that for, for the time. Anyway, so uh, I get this one disc that says Carol Yonch, Concerturian Violin Concerto. Carol Yonch, uh, a girl tuba player. Okay, fine. Concerturian Violin Concerto. There's a tuba part. <laughs> so <laughs> put the disc in, I hear a piano introduction, and I hear a tuba playing the solo violin part. And this goes on for 11 minutes of just absolutely virtuosic <laughs> playing. And then there's applause. It was a live performance, even, you know? Wow. So I closed my mouth <laughs> and I hit replay on the machine, listen to it again. So I brought the, uh, we had a concert that night. I, I brought the disc in and played it for colleagues and they said, well, give the kid an audition. Like, you know, in next month we're having an audition. So uh, she came to uh, that one. And um, we, in that one, we declared no winner, but we had six finalists. And so each of the finalists came and played a chunk of weeks for the orchestra the next season because we needed a, a tuba player because Paul had retired. So uh, she played a, a chunk of weeks in uh, like October, and then she came back in February, and uh, just played beautifully. And uh, we were doing, uh, we did Bruckner 7 in Carnegie Hall, Simon Rattle was conducting that night. And uh, so we, a lot of times we'll do like a five o'clock, just a short 30 minute rehearsal, touch up, and then uh, do the eight o'clock concert. So we finished the five o'clock uh, rehearsal, and Simon comes walking back through the orchestra and comes up to Carol and says, I want you to know we're going to have a tuba audition in Berlin, and you'll be getting an invitation, and it's coming from me. I'm going, <laughs> this doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, Raoul doesn't walk up to you and invite you to audition for the Berlin Philharmonic. 
So, like two weeks later was again the uh, uh, another audition for the Philadelphia Orchestra. Carol came out on top of that one, and, and on the uh, basis of having played six weeks in the orchestra and done well in two auditions, so she was still then was, like me. She was still a senior in school. She was still a student when she was hired. Wow! But on on the basis of uh, two wonderful auditions and uh, you know, several weeks of subbing in the orchestra, we took a chance on hiring. I think she was still 20, 20 or twenty-one at the time. Uh, college wow. senior from the University of Michigan. So that's how we found Carol. And how, how long has she been in the orchestra now? This is 12 or 13, something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What a great yeah. story. Thanks yeah. for, uh, thanks sure. for sharing that. Sure. Let's, um, let's turn the corner a little bit and talk about your uh, work as a solo artist and, and you talked about the, the very beginnings of it, winning mm -hmm. that the, the, uh, yeah. competition. That's amazing. And you have uh, a solo disc out, Fancy Free. Thank you. Uh, you've soloed with the, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Atlanta Symphony, National Symphony of Taiwan. Couple um, others, yeah. Talk about that a little bit in your approach to to being a soloist. Sure. Uh, obviously, the bass trombone not always thought of as a solo uh, instrument. Although now, thanks to yourself and Charlie Vernon and Dave yeah, Taylor and, others, and yeah. you know that are sure. really forging uh, yeah. some very positive ground for the instrument as a solo. Uh, instrument. Yeah, um, I do some solo work. I don't do a lot. Uh, others are, are more active in that thing, but uh, I have some nice opportunities over the years. And being completely honest, um, doing solo work is not what I enjoy the most. Okay. I'm I'm happily doing what I love, playing in the orchestra, playing in ensembles. Um, I enjoy having done concertos. <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy okay, yeah. doing concertos. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Yeah, right. yeah, you know, it's it's hard, stressful work, and yeah. it's not where I'm most comfortable. Uh, I feel like I can do it successfully when I need to, but it's not what I enjoy doing the most. Just mm -hmm. me, me mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. Um, so, but it's you know when you get an off and you know, get an invitation, it's you know, kind of hard to turn down. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, and it's uh, been nice to you know uh, have a chance to champion a couple new works. Uh, there's a Philadelphia composer, Jay Crush, wrote a beautiful concerto for me. I played it here uh, at Juilliard for the trombone convention a couple summers mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Played it a couple different places. So it's uh, always. Um, uh, thrilling to have a, a new piece written for you, and especially then something you really like. Yeah. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about uh, you. You know your roles in the ch in chamber music, and, and specifically, I'd like to ask you about uh, Four of a Kind, which mm -hmm. is uh, all of you trombone players out there. You all know Four of a Kind. You have many recordings out, and it's uh, about as big of an all-star group as you could possibly get. You've got uh, Joe Alessi. Scott Hartman, one of the most beautiful players ever. Mark Lawrence, also. Mm -hmm. I mean, all four of you could have the same introduction. It's like the, the, as was, good as it gets. We but had a great time. Uh, talk about that group a little bit and and the and the, uh, and the recordings that you guys have sure. done. I think it was mostly uh, Joe and Mark cooked that up, and then they invited Scott and I to join. Okay, is sort of how that got started. Because uh, at that point, um, so we, we did the first disc in the late '80s or early '90s. I forget exactly when it went. Right around 1990. And at that point, there really weren't too many trombone quartet recordings out there. There was a famous Paris quartet from the 70s, right, you right, know. with Michelle but, and... Yeah, 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 yeah. But there really wasn't too much after that. There may be one or two things here and there. But, um, so they cooked up the idea to do that. And, and uh, Scott and I said, sure, that sounds like a great project. We'd love to join you. So... Um, we organized that, you know, long distance. Uh, I guess there wasn't so much email in those days. There was just a lot of telephone calls and faxes <laughs> or whatever not. Um, and so then we rehearsed for three or four days and then we recorded for three or four days. And we did that at Curtis. The mm. first disc we did in Philly. Uh, second disc we did up at the uh, Academy of Arts and Letters, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. And like an old uh, recital, speaking recital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hall up in, I guess it's Harlem, I guess is mm -hmm. where it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You New Yorkers know better than I do, but um, so the, those were two great projects to work on that. And we did several tours. Uh, we did projects in Korea and Japan, Taiwan. Mostly did like a lot of work in Asia with the group. We uh, had many more invitations that we sadly had to turn down. Yeah. Just cause trying to get the four bodies in the same city at the same time is always a minor miracle. So <laughs> it's been been several years since we've done anything together, but uh, it's a, a wonderful memory, and we're very proud of those recordings. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the group and, uh, yeah. and uh, well, all of you guys individually, but uh, yeah. I can imagine trying to juggle those four schedules yeah. would be a, yeah. a challenge to say the least. Um, let's talk about your teaching. Um, you're a renowned teacher, uh, clearly. You're on the faculty here at Juilliard Curtis Temple. Um, 
how 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 do you enjoy that? What uh, I know you were describing your schedule to me before uh, mm -hmm. we started. It's like mind boggling how That's you fit all that, that in. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's totally doable. I, I do it every week. It's, it's not completely crazy. But uh, so um, uh, teaching is something I enjoy, and I as um, more I enjoy it more and more. Um, just you know, uh, trying to get a, inside a student's mind and figure out how to motivate them. Um, but uh, so I've, I've taught at uh, Curtis and Temple for many, many years, and then this is my fifth year teaching here at Juilliard. I was mm -hmm. thrilled to join the, the faculty at this you know, wonderfully um, amazing, famous music school. I started here subbing for Paul Pollard when uh, he took a year off and took a job in Finland for a while, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, they liked me and asked me to stay on, so I said, of course, so I'm uh, honored to be teaching here. So this is my fifth year. And so I come here on Mondays. It, it's about a two-hour commute from Philly. So I just I leave early in the morning. I get here and uh, have a bite to eat and warm up and start teaching at 10. And I get a break in the afternoon and finish at supper time and turn around and go home. Mm -hmm. So um, with Philly Orchestra, we play in Carnegie Hall uh, four or five times a year anyway. So I'll, I can combine those trips and all that. But uh, So most Mondays, I'm up, up here in New York. And it's sort of it's nice to be here in the, in the big city every now and then. Yeah. Like so I sometimes I don't see anything. Like I got off the subway, came you know right into school. That was at nine in the morning and it's eight o'clock at night. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> don't see anything in New York <laughs> in school all day. Well, this is a particularly good spot in New York, so at least you get that. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, it's no stress on the commute uh, with uh, the train and all that. So it uh, I enjoy it. Yeah, great. And at Curtis, I'm um, guessing your load is a little lighter than here? Or well, that, so Curtis has just one bass trombone. Right. So I teach the one lesson, but then uh, the faculty, we rotate through coaching brass quintets and orchestral repertoire classes, a low brass class, and then we have a brass and percussion choir, and I conduct that. So we do okay. one, one concert here with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And we're doing, uh, we're doing a concert of Eric Oazen's music. Oh, and nice, so we were nice, talking to Eric, nice. so a colleague from the uh, faculty here at Juilliard, so he's going to come down to Curtis in early November, and we'll do a concert of his music. Oh, awesome. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. And, yeah, and we were Tons of great stuff. fortunate to get him to uh, sit in the chair yeah. you're sitting in, and he yeah. was uh, as, as great uh, an interview as he is a composer. It was really <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, if you don't mind, and, we, and I asked you this beforehand because I want to make sure it was, you were comfortable with it, you've been involved with uh, negotiations through some difficult times sure. with uh, uh -huh. the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, when we've had uh, a variety of orchestral players from Phil Smith to Mark Gould to Joe Alessi to David Krauss and every, many, many others in between, um, can you talk about your feeling about the state of, mm -hmm. particularly in America, American orchestras and and I know you went through, I guess it was a difficult bankruptcy period for the, yep, for the orchestra. And, and as much that. as you're comfortable, because I, yeah, yeah. I don't want you to have to get into a, uh, a turbulent air there at all. <laughs> but, uh, but as much as you'd like to share with us, I'd sure. love to hear what your thoughts are about the state of uh, orchestras in, the, in, in 2018. Thanks. Here. Just to, in general, I've done a fair amount of, I call it, backstage work at the orchestra. Um, union negotiation committees. Uh, I chaired the committee that hired Yannick Nazetz again, our music director, which we're sharing at the Met now too. Mm, so right, he, right, so right. He, he he's two cities too. Okay. He and I go back and forth between <laughs> Philly and New York. He, I think he travels a little differently than I do. But <laughs> 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 anyway, so I've been involved in a fair amount of backstage work, so I, I have some experience from which to speak. But. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm correct in saying that there are more orchestra concerts now in the United States than there have ever been before. Really? Okay. There are more orchestras playing more concerts. Okay. Uh, if you think, you know, uh, you know, 30 years ago, there were, weren't as many smaller orchestras playing concerts, mm -hmm. you know. So, the, and there have always been ups and downs. Uh, since the time of Mozart, classical music has had its, you know, <laughs> financial hassles, right? So he died a pauper, right? Yeah, you know? right, right. Um, so the, the, what we do is not a mass music art form. You know, you, right, you, you play yeah, with the Rolling yeah. Stones, you play for 50,000 people in a stadium, right? You know. Well, so. I didn't, but I was playing for the people that were playing for those 50,000 people. <laughs> So uh, the most I ever we had, we had like seventeen or eighteen thousand for we did like a, a Star Wars and Planets concert you know in, right. in a summer venue so that's like the most we've ever had, but uh, we play uh, 130, 140 concerts a year or something like that, um, and so there's there's tons of orchestral music in the United States and and more than ever before, uh, so uh, there is absolutely demand for it. It waxes and wanes. Uh, there are individual uh, geographical reasons for this city versus that city would have good times or bad times. 
Um, so just Philadelphia Orchestra, we did a bankruptcy restructuring in 2011 or 12, and uh, I was one of the musicians on the committee that uh, represented my colleagues through that with our management and the bankruptcy court. Boy, did I learn way too much about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, that was driven by pensions. Okay. So. Um, uh, most full-time orchestra players were, they were were very fortunate to have. These are really good jobs with a good course, salary yeah. and a good suite of benefits, which is um, negotiated through union negotiations, which does a lot for the individual members of the orchestra. And uh, so there was a pension with that. And uh, pensions, it's a, all there are very few institutions in the United States anymore which you get a traditional pension, like every month you get a check for X dollars. You know, mm -hmm. it's everything's gone for, toward defined. Current contribution is defined, is defined benefit. So the Philadelphia Orchestra was having a terrible time with the pensions and it was really driven by the board members of the orchestra and that's why you have a board for a nonprofit organization like that. You have business leaders from the community who bring their expertise and say this isn't working. You mm -hmm. people are going to have to fix this. And so the only way to, to solve the pension problem was to do this bankruptcy restructuring. So um, the way I say it, six years down the road, my employer is financially healthier than it was then. So that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Yeah, So absolutely. I'll take that. Um, there were a, a few colleagues who retired shortly before that whose pension was reduced a little bit, not a lot. Okay. So that's lousy. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone works for 30 years and expecting to get a pension, then they get it, but, oh, we're going to take some back. That's really not cool. Yeah. So the bankruptcy is difficult. I'm not, I, in no way do I mean to make light of it. But I think six years down the road, there, were, there are positives as well as the negatives. Mm -hmm. I'll give it mm -hmm. that. So in general, I think uh, the orchestra business is, is good. Um, we have to adapt with the times. We sell far fewer subscriptions than we used to. Oh, really? Um, okay. Uh, when I started, the Philadelphia Orchestra was sold out by subscription. You could not walk up and buy a single ticket. Wow, okay. We had a wonderful problem. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> you couldn't walk up and buy a ticket. So they actually made a decision to stop selling uh, that and to reserve some tickets for single ticket sales. Uh, that subscriber model seems to be uh, vanishing now, and mm, uh, orchestras and uh, even you know any um, drama club or anything, subscription sales are, are really going away. Um, we all want things on demand now. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I'm going to stream my Netflix on demand. You know, I'm not going to wait till Saturday night at nine o'clock when the show comes on or whatever. You know, so uh, the people just are. are the, they we still sell. We're we're in, we some concerts sell out. Most do not. Mm -hmm. So uh, attendance is down some, but um, it's certainly not. Uh, it's a concern, but it's not panic level yet. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So, so the orchestra business in general is is good. Um, there's a famous uh, interview uh, with Leonard Bernstein in Time Magazine from the late si 60s. He said, the symphony is dead. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I think he meant really the construction of a four movement in a Beethoven symphony. Oh, okay. But by extension, he was also um, uh, some sort of death knell for orchestras. But, so it, uh, the art form absolutely evolves. And uh, we do, uh, the new thing we're doing now is doing live scores for movies. Mm -hmm. That sells gangs of tickets. Right. Those are great. So we, we do Star Wars and Harry Potter and Gladiator and whatever. Mostly we do that in summer, sometimes in, in the in winter season. But um, our audiences love that. So, okay, <laughs> yes. let's, let's do what the audience wants, you know. Um, so it's the the art form is never going to be the Rolling Stones. It's never going to be Microsoft or Apple computer. Um, but um, the, the business is in reasonable health. How about that? Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. I mean, that's it's really good to hear that. You know, and especially from a from an outsider's perspective, who's a fan yeah. and 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 knows a lot of the, a lot of the folks in the, in the business, it's it's good to hear that. You know, the bad news makes the headlines. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? If it bleeds, it leads. You yeah, know, yeah. You know. And so we humans, we we want bad news in our newspapers, whatever reason. That, that, yeah. That's what sells. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, that's not the whole picture. Yeah. That's good to hear. Well, it's really good to hear. Yeah. yeah as I'm sure you know, the uh, the AF of M pension situation is uh, uh -huh. in very dire straits. But you guys have your own well, separate so pension from from. And that's from what, and that's where the our business leaders on our Philadelphia Orchestra board uh, had experienced this already in their own corporations. 
and they said this pension you're going to have a serious problem here soon you better fix it we'll fix it now and so yeah the f of m has a huge problem now and the, the simple reason is well you'll see if you, if you leave this in or not um oh i'll leave um, it in <laughs> uh, uh, Amer american pension law is insufficient that right. a business can meet its legal obligation to put money into the pension fund yet still not put enough in to pay all the people right so that's why there's, you know, all these various pensions have gone, uh, or our businesses have gone uh, under because of the pensions, or um, there's very few corporations that have a pension anymore because it's, uh, it's expensive and you can be legal and still insufficient. Yeah. And I think we're seeing, I mean, not to get too far into it, but in the AFM situation, I think we're seeing some severe mismanagement of... Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> but 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 we'll leave it at that. Yeah. And 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 you know it's not a unique problem, and we can't sit there, especially as musicians. And woe is us because that never works. And you see it all over the place. The city, the city of New York has is dealing with all yep. kinds of pension yep. issues. State uh, of New Jersey, yeah. Teachers is, uh, unions have the same issues. So it's it's a, like you you know you put it very eloquently. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, uh, it's an issue that you have to address, and it's good that you guys, as an orchestra, were yeah. able to navigate That's through that. Yeah. That's great. Um, let's talk about something that we're very <laughs> passionate about, and uh, we're both associated with the great S.C. Shires company, oh, and sure. I, I couldn't be happier from, from, to be with them. I think it's just a, the, making the best trombones and uh, trumpets going these days, and uh, just a great group of folks from the ownership down to the uh, artist mm -hmm. rep, and I think we both have Sam as our uh, yep. person that we deal with. He couldn't, couldn't ask for a better person to deal with on a, on a basis for that we do anyway um let's talk about the blair bollinger mm -hmm. uh model bass trombone i know it's a very popular instrument uh, Thanks, among bass well. trombones and yeah. selling well for for Good. sure shires but, sure. but but give us an introduction to this great instrument so uh the the main thing about this instrument is what we do with the valves they're tuned slightly differently um uh, most uh, bass trombones uh, these days would have a the first valve is tuned in F, the second... This is all trombone players watching this, right? Predominantly, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get trombone specific here, all right? We do have a, a small group of uh, housewives who like to uh, uh, okay. like follow our okay, thing, so they may check out. This might be a good time to go to the... Yeah, uh, we're going to go hardcore <laughs> bass trombone here for a minute, okay? So mostly this is an F, this one's in G flat, two, two together, a D. So with mine, I call it quarter tone G. So the second valve is neither G nor G flat. But what that does is makes the, all the other the positions line up on the horn. So the way I say it is uh, Western classical music is built on scales and arpeggios. If you can design your instrument to make it easier to play scales and arpeggios, well then many passes and messages in, in uh, many pieces will become easier. So with this instrument, so the arpeggios are all right there. Wow. You don't have to tune. If, if it's tuned differently, then you always have two and a half or four and a half. You have all these right. minor right. adjustments you have to make. With this system, then a lot of those arpeggios are just right in place. So that's, that was how, how I came together with Shires. Um, because uh, I had uh, explained this uh, tuning system to several makers over the years. I remember sitting down with Mick Rath and had a nice lunch and explained this. He said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I said, great, so you'll build it. He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I have to build what my customers want to buy. They don't know this. They won't want to buy it. Hmm? Well, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So then I figured, well, I guess i got to write a little book so then uh, people will know what it is and then maybe we'll learn why. So uh, I guess when it's been maybe 10, 15 years ago, I just wrote a little book and then went down to Washington to the trombone convention there and did a lecture and presented the book. And then, uh, I don't know, some period of time later, a uh, 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 phone rang and it was uh, Shire said, we're getting a lot of requests for instruments with your tuning system. Can you explain what that is? Finally! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So then... Um, uh, I, would, I had played Edwards for 20 years, very fine trombones, and uh, they would customize it for me, cut it, uh, to my specific design. And um, so I said to Shires, you know, here's a copy of the book. You know, I'm not really shopping, but I always just try and keep up with what's on the market. I'd love to try. You know, I admired the reputation and the quality of the instruments for years. And a uh, short time after that, they called back and said, well, rather than us sending you something, would you like to work with us to make a Ballinger model trombone? I said, well, thank you. Yes, that would be very nice. So then I made uh, several trips up to Boston trying this and working with Steve. And you know, yeah. it was a great mind for brass design. Incredible. And yeah. uh, I had s some of my ideas are in here and probably more of Steve's ideas are in here. <laughs> but um, so then I was thrilled to make one this. So then um, this is the Bollinger model. And you can get it with this. I have the screw bell on here today. Or you can get it with the fixed bell as well. So when I travel around, actually, there's a, we make a, a travel model and an orchestra model. 
And uh, so the orchestra model, I play every day in the orchestra and then uh, travel with the screw bell and a flat does, case. Does is, it make a di big difference having the screw bell? Do you well, find sure. Or, yeah. 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 Um, this uh, is a lighter bell. If you took a regular bell and, and cut it and put the collar on, you're adding a, a whole lot of resistance oh, okay, right sure. here at the sure. throat. You know? okay. So we start with a light, lightweight bell. Okay. So it's lighter because yeah, if you if you have a, if you have a bell you like, don't cut it. Don't cut it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, so but the lightweight bell with the screw collar plays similar to the regular bell. Right. Okay. I saw a nice um, a nice benefit. I saw the uh, your de demonstration uh, video of it with the nice case and like you can get it on the plane and yep. all that kind yeah, of good yeah, stuff. So uh, yeah, that's pretty that's pretty cool. When I travel with the orchestra, we're for, they have trunks for us, you know, wardrobe trunks, instruments trunks. So then I normally take the fixed bell instrument on tour with the orchestra because okay. we have a, a big trunk yeah, that yeah. It goes in. But when I travel by myself, I take the cut bell. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, it sounds amazing. I, I don't think it's all the horn, but uh, <laughs> You're very kind. but it, but it is a a great instrument. And uh, those of you who are looking for a bass trombone, definitely Thanks. check that out for sure. Um, uh, and I should also mention uh, Blair is kind enough. He's going to be doing a lesson on our Hip Bone U series, which will be coming out in a few months. Uh, a lot more uh, specifics about the uh, about his valves and about the instrument. So we'll. Uh, um, kind of stay tuned for that. Um, Blair, as we wind down here, I don't want to take up all your time tonight. you got a long okay, drive ahead of, ahead of you. Um, to maybe talk to us a little bit about what's what's coming up for you. Obviously, you're going strong with the orchestra, working here at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. Any other projects that you're looking that forward to? That keeps me pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like <laughs> so, yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, I, and so, you know, Mondays I'm here and Tuesdays I'm at Temple and then uh, Thursdays at the orchestra and then we have concerts the weekend. And um, You ever get a day off or you? Sundays. Oh, you get it. Okay, Sundays, good, yeah. good, good. I take some, you know, every now and then we have, let me, six six times a year we do, six or eight times a year we have Sunday afternoon Philly Orchestra concerts, but otherwise, no, I, I, I need a day off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sunday's a day of rest. Oh, good. So, um, but then uh, I always enjoy doing classes uh, on, we're on tour with the orchestra. So in May we go back to uh, Beijing in Shanghai, and I'm sure I'll do some classes over there. Nice. In there. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Well, I tend to ask this as a final question, and especially when we get somebody of, uh, of your stature and experience. Um, uh, for young or musicians out there, and it's such a competitive field now, uh, if you could kind of capsulize your advice, which obviously you give extensive advice to your students mm -hmm. every day, um, but what advice would you have for young uh, specifically young trombone players who maybe want to be the next Nitsan or the next Blair Bollinger or uh, uh, what, what if, if you could kind of pare it down to something very uh, The, the very best specific. thing, if, if you're a young player who wants to play in a big orchestra, you have to go somewhere where you can hear a big orchestra every week. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Just absorb that sound, watch what these people do. Um, so uh, if uh, they're... Uh, it, if you can be near you know, one of the big U.S. five orchestras, I, I think that's best. There are many fine music schools that are not near a big orchestra, so then go hear the, the symphony there, you know, the, the local professional orchestra, the, the best that you can. But um, you need to hear a good orchestra live a lot mm -hmm. just to really absorb it. I think that's, that's the main thing. Um, and a, a, a good teacher is great, but it's, there are also other ways to get there. You know, there's... Uh, um, there are there's some players who had relatively little formal training really? in the wow. Philadelphia Orchestra, mm. we, and we have we have some who didn't major in music. Mm. You know, so there's a bunch of ways to get there, um, but you have to know what you want to sound like before you can sound that mm. way. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I mean, I I can't. I think being able to listen both as a human being, but for sure as a musician, uh, no matter what style of music you're playing, the ability to listen and, and yeah. have access, as you just des uh, described, uh, absolutely vital. So, Blair, what a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Mike. Th thank you so sure. much for uh, taking sure. time out for thank, us. Thank and, uh, the invitation. You, you have a great project here. I'm uh, thrilled to be part of it. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and uh, I hope all of you enjoyed this as much as uh, I've enjoyed uh, this evening. It's been fantastic spending some time with Blair. We will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick.